Inflammation you've probably heard this term thrown around, and, whether you were aware of it or not, you've most likely experienced some type of inflammation during your lifetime. At present, the word inflammation is used liberally in medical communities. If you are suffering from pain in certain areas, a medical professional may deem it inflammation. There is something else going on if you have inflammation it doesn't operate alone. This mistaken belief needs to be rectified. Inflammation is a sign that there is a greater problem taking place in the body. If an individual is complaining of back pain, knee problems, or gut issues, his or her doctor or practitioner may suggest that inflammation is to blame. And, while inflammation may be present, it is never the answer. It is simply an indication that something else in the body needs to be addressed. Inflammation never develops on its own, and only emerges for two reasons. The first reason inflammation may appear is if you experience a physical injury. Physicians are aware of this type of inflammation. Any damage to the body, whether it be external or internal, may give rise to inflammation. What most doctors and health practitioners aren't aware of is that an invader in the body is the second reason inflammation can surface. Invader refers to any type of pathogen in the body. There are hundreds of invaders that can stir up inflammation issues in the body from rashes to body aches and pains and much more. Recovering from any replacement surgery is just one example of how pathogens can create inflammation and impact the body's ability to heal. Someone may have knee replacement surgery, recover quickly and find him or herself walking soon after without issue. In this instance, the person is not likely to have had invaders triggering inflammation issues around the area where the surgery took place. However, if you have knee replacement surgery and the knee does not seem to be calming down or healing properly after an extended period of recovery, it is likely that an invader is creating issues. This invader and the chronic inflammation it can provoke may have even been part of the reason the knee joint wore out initially. When it comes to knee and hip replacements, often a slow, extended recovery, at least in part, is related to the Epstein-Barr virus in the body. There are several types of inflammation. Through these examples, you can develop a better understanding of how invaders play a major role in the creation of inflammation in the body. Many people suffer from different levels of brain inflammation. Nerves connected to the brain run throughout the body, branching out into various parts of the system. Neurological inflammation can occur when these nerves become inflamed. Numerous pathogenic invaders can play a part in the creation of this neurological inflammation, along with other factors like heavy metal poisoning or MSG toxicity. Chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, is often the result of mild brain inflammation from an Epstein-Barr virus. Even very mild brain inflammation can trigger a severe case of this condition. If you have CFS, a specialist may be able to tell you that you have brain inflammation, but he or she will not be able to tell you the pathogen responsible. For decades I've been able to tell people whether Epstein-Barr is the invader, or Epstein-Barr and shingles are the invaders or whether it's a combination of Epstein-Barr, shingles, and HHV6. Inflammation in various organs can lead to major health issues, but it's the pathogen or injury that is the true cause of these issues. Liver inflammation is an issue with extreme frequency. Liver inflammation is often the result of pathogens wreaking havoc in this organ. An invader can cause a number of problems including triggering elevated liver enzymes. If particular damage is seen on an MRI or CT scan, someone may be handed a hepatitis C diagnosis. Although medical communities know that hepatitis A, B, C, and D stem from viral issues, what medical research and medical science do not know is which virus is creating these issues. They have no clue that the cause of hepatitis C is Epstein-Barr creating damage in the liver for an extended period of time because they have yet to single out the particular bugs that are triggering these issues. Instead, the medical profession has to rely on uninflammatory markers in the blood or MRs and CT scans to classify a hepatic liver at different stages of inflammation. What they have not yet realized is that inflammation is not the answer. The true answer is that Epstein-Barr virus, sometimes along with other herpetic viruses, are creating the inflamed liver. A inflammation can arise from a number of different bacteria getting into this organ. You can pick up a sty. Staff or come down with a flu just from touching door handles in public places and rubbing your eyes. Glaucoma stems from a mutated variety of the Epstein-Barr virus that triggers eye problems. Other types of inflammation you may experience include skin inflammation, gut inflammation, or colon inflammation. 
A number of invaders can enter the gut, wreak havoc, and trigger inflammation. For example, if you suffer from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, you most likely have streptococcus in your system that is creating inflammation and other issues in the gut. Various viruses and bacteria can sit inside the colon and stir up major issues. Some of the viruses you may be dealing with include a variety of the shingles, a strain of Epstein-Barr, a mutated HHV6 virus, cytomegalovirus, undiscovered HHV10, HHV11, HHV12 or another of the many herpetic viruses in existence. Conditions connected to colon inflammation can have a number of different instigators. If you suffer from colitis, a variety of the shingles virus is often the culprit. Inflammation can also occur if you catch a flu. If you are only experiencing cold-like symptoms you may think you have a rhinovirus, but these viruses no longer exist. The flu, which has globally taken over, now emerges approximately every two months, and can trigger severe inflammation. It can trigger inflammation in the sinuses, chest, lungs, and gut and may give rise to issues such as bronchitis, a serious cough, and severely weakened adrenals. Another reason for inflamed sinuses is the result of streptococcus inside the sinus linings. Streptococcus, which can be nestled inside these linings since childhood, can create persistent mystery sinus inflammation. Some doctors or practitioners may respond with the inaccurate notion that certain foods, such as wheat, inflame certain individuals, but this is not accurate. Gluten itself does not inflame the body. What gluten does do is feed the invaders, pathogens, in your body that give rise to inflammation. For example, there is a tremendous amount of misinformation surrounding celiac disease. Celiac is not hereditary. It is an inflammatory illness where pathogens in the body are feverishly feeding on any gluten that's consumed. Fueling these pathogens can lead to a host of negative reactions in the body, but the gluten is not directly responsible for any of these negative consequences. If you do not have a pathogen in your system or only have an extremely dormant pathogen, then you will be able to eat all the gluten you desire without creating inflammation. Unproductive food choices may lead to other issues like the development of gallstones, which could lead to an internal injury if the gallstone gets stuck in the gallbladder duct. But any inflammation that arises from this issue would be injury not pathogen related. Like the foods you choose to eat, heavy metals in the system do not technically cause inflammation. However, heavy metals are a preferred food for invaders in the body that do cause inflammation. It's very important to remove heavy metals from the body for this reason. There are a number of inflammatory tests you can have done. But I like to refer to these tests as guest tests because they can only reveal so much information and do not highlight the underlying cause or provide you with answers on how to move forward. Let's take a look at some of the available inflammatory guest tests. The C-reactive protein test simply lets doctors know that there is inflammation, but the test cannot reveal why the inflammation is present. This is true of the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR or SED rate, test as well. Once doctors use these tests to establish that you have inflammation, they are likely to hand you a label, but will not be able to provide you with a cause or sufficient answers to help you heal. The plasma viscosity, PV, test, IG and IgG tests, and the antinuclear antibody test, INA, are some other tests that may help to reveal inflammation in your body, but will not provide you with any additional insight into the true cause. When you are working to reduce inflammation, the more anti-inflammatory foods you can bring into your diet the better. Garlic, which helps kill pathogens, is an excellent anti-inflammatory food. Figs can kill pathogens in the gut, making them an incredible anti-inflammatory option as well. If you have a number of pathogens in your system, it is best to not eat too many figs in one sitting because of the strong detox reaction you may experience. Like figs, kiwis work in the gut to help destroy pathogens. The antipathogenic properties in lemons and limes are powerful, so make sure to squeeze these citrus fruits in water, on salads, and in your favorite sauces and dressings. If you are suffering with inflammation and think you may have a bacteria, parasite or virus of any kind, bring plenty of pears into your diet. Their anti-inflammatory attributes can be incredibly beneficial. Papaya can be a particularly powerful food if you are suffering from gut inflammation. Apples, wild blueberries, and leafy greens such as lettuces, arugula, and kale are other wonderful, pathogen-fighting foods that consequently help lower inflammation. Peaches, 
plums, nectarines, melons, mangoes, and cherries are even more flavorful anti-inflammatory recommendations. Some pathogen-destroying anti-inflammatory herbs to incorporate into your diet include rosemary, thyme, sage, and oregano. Another supportive food to bring in regularly is aloe vera. Nettle leaf and lemon balm are wonderful anti-pathogenic supplement options. Licorice root, another anti-inflammatory choice, is especially good at fighting off herpetic viruses. Bringing in a licorice root supplement or regularly drinking licorice root tea can be a powerful step. As you bring more life-giving, anti-inflammatory fruits and veggies into your diet, it is beneficial to begin eliminating the foods that feed the pathogens that trigger an inflammatory response. Foods to remove from your diet while you heal include wheat, gluten, and dairy such as milk, cheese, butter, kefir, and yogurt. Other foods to exclude if you have inflammation or think you may be inflamed are eggs, pork, canola oil, and corn. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel.